In this video, I want to talk about how we can use our formulas of compounded interest to make some comparisons, to actually make decisions about what is a better investment. Uh, because you have all these different things going into play, like the number of compounds, we want that to be big. The interest rate, we want that to be big. You know, we, we kind of see what's our good things, but what happens when, when you have these competing variables? How does one decide what the better investment is over time? So I want to show you some examples where we can actually analyze how good the investments are when we compare them apples to apples. So suppose we have a zero bond, a zero coupon bond that can be redeemed in 10 years for $1,000. So this is kind of like how government bonds work. Like my grandma would always send me like, here's a $100 bond. And as a kid, you're like, wow, I'm five years old. Now I have $100, which of course I, I, you know, I didn't realize as a kid that I don't get $100 until I'm like, 35 or 45 or you know whatever the type of bond was right it's not that it's worth a hundred dollars now is in the future it'll be worth a hundred dollars or in this case a thousand dollars right so this is zero coupon bond in 10 years it's supposed to be worth a thousand dollars well okay grandma had to buy this bond for me how much should she have been willing to pay for a thousand dollars 10 years from now how much would a thousand dollars be worth now so to speak well, it depends on the interest rate. Let's suppose that at the time the bond was purchased, uh, the the you could get an interest loan for 8% compounded monthly. Well, if that's your interest rate, R, and our number of compounds is 12, right, and we want to invest this for 10 years and our principal was $1,000, then we can put this into our compounded interest formula. We get the amount is equal to the principal times 1 plus R over N to the NT. We can start plugging things in. We'd end up with 1,000. And I asked actually, well, that's where I, mis I miswrote on the screen earlier. That 1,000 isn't the principal, right? We're not investing $1,000. Uh, that's how much it's supposed to be worth after 10 years. So the amount is $1,000. And this is going to equal the principal, which I don't actually know what that is, uh, 1 plus 8% over 12 raised to the 12 times 10. So the thing is, we actually don't know what the principal is. Aha, right? How much should you be willing to pay for it? Like, how much should I pay for it now? That would be the principal of this loan. So we need to solve for P, which in order to do that, you probably want to divide this quantity on both sides. So you get 1 plus 0 0.08 divided by 12 raised to the 12.10 power right there. So you have to divide that on the other side. It's like, ooh, that's a mess. Um, but one thing to remember is when you divide by exponents, you actually could just stick a negative inside the denominator or inside the exponent. And that actually makes it come up to the top right here. So if you divide both sides by this, instead of writing this big honker over here in the denominator, we can actually just use a, a negative exponent. And what we see is something like the following. The principal is equal to the amount times one plus R over N raised to the negative NT. Um, I actually like to think, I'd like to think of as we're going back in time. So, you know, get your get your Mr. Fuge, Fusion and jump into the, your, your DeLorean here. It's as if, okay, we're in the year 2020, right? Uh, just, just as an example, and it's worth $1,000. If I went back in time to the year 2010, uh, I probably should go back to 2015 if I'm continuing with this back to the future uh, comparison here. But nonetheless, this video was recorded in 2020. Um, if we go back in time 10 years, how much should it be? So we have this negative time because we're going back in time. All right, so let's now put this into our formula. The amount will be worth $1,000. The interest rate is 8%. The number of compounds will be 12 because we're doing monthly. And then the time frame will be 10 years. We're going back negative 10. So I really should think of this as 10, 12 times negative 10, if that helps you out. In terms of multiplication, it doesn't make much of a difference. It'll be negative 120 in the end anyways. Uh, points or 8% divided by 12 will be 0 0.006 repeated. Add that to one, you get 1.006 repeated. Just add a lot of sixes in that as you're trying to compute this. Take it to negative 120, the negative 120th power, you're going to end up with 0 0.4505. Again, try to keep this as much in your calculator memory as possible. You don't want to round too early so that your calculation doesn't get error into it. Times this by a thousand. This means that grandma, if she were to buy this loan, if she buy, buy this bond, you know, on my 10th birthday, right? She should be willing to pay $150 so that when I turn 20, uh, again, hypothetically, it's worth $1,000. That's how much the loan should be. That's how much you should pay for the bond. Of course, if the government's willing to sell it to you for lesser than $150, that's great. Um, the problem is people don't always, real, what they don't always realize is like, oh, you buy it for $500. 
um, and then it'll be worth a thousand dollars later. It's like, well, but I, I have a bank account that I can invest in right now. I can invest my five hundred dollars at eight percent compounded monthly. If I don't touch it for ten years, it'll be worth more than a thousand dollars. Your bond stinks, right? We need to compare this. We need to compare this loan versus competing loans exist at the at the time. Well, what if the bond was 7% compounded continuously? So look at that for a moment, right? The interest rate is lesser than, say, the previous one, but it compounds more frequently. Its compounding is infinity versus only 12, right? How does that, how does that affect things? Is it a better loan or not? Well, we can do the comparison here. Now, in this situation, we have to use A equals PERT principal times e to the rt. But the same thing as you divide by e to the rt on both sides, you can, dividing by an exponential, you can just use a negative exponent, go back in time. So the principal is gonna equal the original amount times e to the negative rt. So plug in those values, you get 1000 times e to the negative 0 0.07 times 10. Uh, the exponent's easy enough, you're just gonna get negative 0.7. But then you're going to want to use a calculator whenever you do a calculation with E whatsoever. You're going to plug in E to the negative 0.7 expo exponent and then times that by 1,000. You'll get 496.59. So what's the better bond? Uh, it's going to be this one, right? I can get the same $1,000 with less money. So this is the bond you would want to buy, you know, if your grandma buying it for your grandson on his 10th birthday. 8% monthly is better than 7% continuously. So let's continue with that game. Suppose that you want to open up a money market account. You invest three bank, or you want to, you visit three banks to determine their money market rate. So th th this 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 is uh, what we're trying to describe right here is the idea of a certificate of deposit, uh, sometimes called a CD. Compounded interest is a really good formula if you have a certificate of deposit or something equivalent to a CD here. Because the way that your typical CD works is it's a frozen asset. You deposit your original principal and then you don't touch it for a year, five years, 10 years until the loan, until, until the investment maturates, right? In which case, then it'll collect interest and the interest will collect interest and the interest interest will collect interest. So imagine that's what we're trying to do. So because the idea of like a checking account or a savings account even has an interest rate, you're often making deposits and withdrawals. So the, the, the compound interest formula doesn't really do much for that. We need some more complicated formula. Certificate deposits is what we're trying to talk about right here. So imagine we, we go to three different banks to see what type of CDs could we buy. You didn't know you're going to go to the store uh, to a bank to buy a CD, which of course, I, I know that joke doesn't make much sense in 2020. Who buys CDs anymore? Uh, you know, we, we download our music. Anyways, so we have a certificate of deposit. The bank A, it says we're going to offer you 6% annual interest compounded daily. Wow, that's a great, you know, three. So if you look at that, it's like my, my over here with bank A, you're going to get number of compounds is 365. That's great. And your interest rate is 6%. Okay, that's not, maybe that's good. Maybe that's bad. Let's see. Bank B right, it's going to offer you a 6.02% interest rate, but it's compounded quarterly, all right, well, how does that affect things? So your compounds will be will be four, so dramatically smaller than we saw for daily interest, but your interest rate's better, R equals 0 0.0602, but it's only a little bit better. How does that affect things? Well, we're going to see in a moment. Um, and then Bank C wants to offer you 5.9% uh, interest compounded continuously. Wow, that's great, right? Your number of compounds is infinity. You can't do better than that. But your interest rate is smaller. You're going to get 0.598. So who's the, who's the best choice, right? When you look at these things, these interest rates are only different. They're only off by like 0 .04. Uh, yeah, 0.04%. So it's not a huge difference, but the number of compounds is way different. How do we compare these things apples to apples? And so what we want to do is we're seeking what's so-called the effective rate of interest, which is equivalent. Uh, basically, what we want to do is we want to turn this problem, all of these problems, into a simple interest problem. So if we invested basically $1 for one year at a, at a simple interest rate, what would be the rate of that simple interest? Uh, this Effective rate of interest does not depend on the principal. It does not depend on the time. So again, if we turned all of these into simple interest problems, so we could compare apples to apples, we invest $1 for one year, what rate would that have been? And then whoever has the best effective rate of interest would be the best investment. 
So how do you compute this uh, effective rate of investment? Like I said, we're gonna take our, we're gonna take our E right here. This is the RE is going to be the effective rate of interest. So notice you get P times one plus rate times time. This is this is a simple interest problem, right? The principal, whatever, we're investing for one year at the effective rate of interest. Well, the problem is not actually, of course, a simple interest problem. It's a compounded interest problem. So we're going to set a, equal, a simple interest equal to a compounded interest where the principal's whatevs. Uh, the rate is given, the number of compounds is given, the time is going to equal to 1. So as we simplify the right-hand side, well, the x1 becomes an n. We want to then solve for, uh, we want to solve here. We can also divide both sides by p, because again, the principle doesn't matter. So we get 1 plus re is equal to 1 plus r over n to the n. Subtract 1. This is our formula for effective rate of interest. Of course, if you're doing uh, continuously compounded interest, this would look like e to the r minus 1. Because again, t equals 1 in that situation for continuously compound interest. So we compute this number right here. So for the first one, we're going to take 1 plus 6% divided by 365, raise that to the 365 and minus 1. Uh, you crunch the numbers, la, 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 use your calculator. You end up with 6.183%. That's how good bank A is going to be. So then you look at bank B. So remember, bank A was daily with a 6% uh, interest rate. Bank B was 4%. It has the best, uh, four, four quarters, excuse me, uh, the number of compounds, but it had the best interest rate, 6.02%. When you put the numbers in here, we're going to take 1 plus 6.02% uh, divided by 4, raised to the fourth, subtract 1, crunch the numbers, do, 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 do. You're going to end up with 6.157%, which you can see when you compare that with Bank A, Bank A has a higher uh effective rate of interest. So that's a better investment between the two. What about continuously compounded interest? N equals infinity, right? But the interest rate was smaller, 5.98%. Uh, so you're going to take E to the R. So E to the 5.98%. Uh, that gives you about 1.061624. Subtract so 1. And you end up with 0.061624. Write that as a percentage, right? You're going to get 6.162, which that beats bank B but actually bank A still is the winner here. So believe it or not, the bank with the highest interest rate actually was the worst investment because it had the fewest number of compounds. The, the highest number of compounds also was not the best investment here. Turns out the lukewarm investment was the best one, right? Not too many compounds, not too low interest, right? Bank A is the best deal. And this is what you have to do with finance. When you have these different options, like should I invest this way or this way? Do I take out this loan or what? It, you know, when it comes to your money, it's worth spending a little bit of time and asking yourself, what is the best deal? And you need to make sure you are comparing apples to apples. The effective rate of interest is a tool you can use to actually compare like over time, what's going to be the best investment. And we see here that Bank A offers the best deal of these three certificates of deposits certificates of deposit.